Okay, welcome back. Okay, so today we're going to talk about the beginnings of genetics. You had to understand the basic underpinnings of uh, meiosis in order to understand the shuffling of alleles and, and the basis of genetics. The first thing we're going to cover is selective breeding. Selective breeding is something that farmers have been doing for centuries. And basically what they do is they only allow the ones that contain desirable traits to breed and the rest they call or kill. There was a new focus on genetics that was begun when we started to see the uh, stuff going on in the microscope, uh, looking at the cells, changing states during mitosis and meiosis. And so one of the things that came up was that in about 1910, three independent scientists determined that they came up with the laws of inheritance. However, when they did a research check, which is what responsible scientists do, is they took a look at the research and found out that somebody had been there first, but he was relatively unknown. His name was Gregor Mendel. Mendel was the first person to trace the characteristics of successive generations of a living thing. But he wasn't a world-renowned scientist of his day. He was an Augustinian monk who lived in a monastery, and he taught natural science to high school students. Mendel's attraction to research was based on his love of nature. He often wondered how plants attained atypical characteristics, in other words, unusual characteristics. On one of his frequent walks around the monastery, he found an atypical variety of an ornamental plant. He took it and planted it next to the typical variety, and he grew their progeny side by side to see if there would be any approximation of the traits passed on to the next generation. Mendel's research reflected his personality, and he saw that the traits were inherited in certain numerical ratios, so his mathematician side came out. But it still took seven years to cross and score the plants to the thousands to prove the laws of inheritance. The plant that he focused on was the common garden pea, which is Siam sativum. And the garden pea had a lot of advantages. They can self-pollinate, so you can make sure that you have a pure strain. Another advantage is that they have easily identifiable characteristics to study, and he studied all seven of these types of traits. Those characteristics are influenced by simple dominance and a single pair of alleles. He was extremely lucky in his choice here because that is often not the case in nature. And finally, each pea is an offspring. So each of the little peas inside of a pod is an offspring. So you can have thousands of offspring in a single season. This is much harder to do with even mice in one lifetime because you need thousands and thousands of mice. The three to one ratio that he kept seeing was the key to his discoveries. He always found that when crossing mixed groups that he came up with three of one type and one of a, another type. So he came up with a couple of different principles. The first principle is dominance and dominance meant that some unit characters can mask the expression of others. So in other words, purple is a dominant trait. All of the dominant traits are on the left-hand column. Purple is a dominant trait for flower color. So if you had a purple and a white and you bred them together, you'd see purples, mostly. He came up with also the principle of unit characters, which states that individuals pass information on as individual traits. Now, by the way, I just wanted to let you know, you will be expected to, to understand that, you know, tall plants are dominant to dwarf plants. But other than that, I'll generally tell you, other than purple and white and tall and dwarf, which one is the dominant trait. Okay. Unit characters means that individuals pass information on as individual traits. The principle of dominance says that unit characters can mask the expression of others. Segregation states that each unit character separates into a different sex cell. And independent assortment states that factors, which later became known as genes, but he didn't know that, he called them factors, 
segregate according to chance. So it's a random chance. And we talked about those random chances during the meiosis unit. If you don't remember what the three bases of genetic variability are, you need to go back and take a look at the meiosis lecture notes. So you're like, yeah, 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 so what? So what does that tell us? Well, you need a couple of vocabulary terms, and so I want you to make sure that you've defined these. An allele has already been defined for you, but to remind you, it's an alternate form of a gene. Remember, all alleles come to being by mutation. Dominant is the gene that is always expressed when it is present. Recessive means that it's the gene that is masked in the presence of the dominant genes. So you have to have two copies of the recessive gene in order for you to see the recessive gene expression. A Punnett square is a mathematical device used by geneticists to show combinations of gametes and predict the traits of offspring. Now the Punnett squares that you'll be doing in class will only be either one trait or two trait Punnett squares, but usually when geneticists are doing work with this, they do mathematical calculations for multiple genes, and so it gets quite hairy quite quickly. The genotypes is the combination of letters represent the dominant or recessive genes present for a trait. And you'll see me abbreviate those with like A's and B's and C's and things like that. The phenotype is the external expression of that gene. In other words, it's what's seen. And so in this case, you've got a black chicken and a white chicken. Those are the phenotypes. They're black or white. But the genotypes are the little circles. They're represented by the circles underneath each chicken. Homozygous means an individual has two of the same allele for that trait. So if you take a look at the top row of chickens, you'll see the black has two black alleles and the white has two white alleles. So both of those are homozygous. Heterozygous means that an individual has one dominant allele and one of the recessive alleles, but they show the dominant traits. And you can see that in the second row of chickens because they have one black and one white gene. Before you start solving crosses, you need to know a couple of things. One, two alleles control each trait. Why? Because you have two chromosomes. You have a maternal chromosome and a paternal chromosome. And so each one of those has an allele. The letters are used to represent the alleles. And the capital means that it's the dominant gene. You only use the same letter. Okay, so you can't go, okay, this is purple and white, so I've got a P and a W. No, you have a big P and a little P. That's how you tell the difference between dominant and recessive. So the lower case of the same letter means recessive. In simple gene dominance, if a dominant gene is, is present, the dominant is expressed in the phenotype. Okay, that ends this lecture, and I want you to make sure that you've understood those basic principles, and we will get into the more uh, nitty-gritty of how to solve those crosses next time. Have a great day.